I'm going to tell you precious little about myself and uh, get right into the topic. For, uh, first of all, for whatever reason, and, and absolutely nothing I've heard from the other presenters today changes my mind about this, but for whatever reason, when we talk about death and darkness, I am drawn to uh, the Dutch masters of the 1500s. I mean, there is very little art that fits better. Uh, to this kind of topic. Um, I'm going to have to ask some of the Dutch folks in our community why this is the case. Uh, I've never lived in Holland, but I'm not sure I'm going to run out and do it after uh, pulling together some of the artwork that you're going to see today. Um, as is often the case on these thematic kind of presentation evenings, even though none of us that are speaking today had any interaction whatsoever about the content of our presentation, I think there's some really interesting overlaps in a number of areas. And uh, I'll let you make up your mind a lot about what this kind of almost boring area of technology might have to do with many of the things that you've heard about and will hear about today. Um, but what I want to do is uh, today is I want to draw your attention to this absolute nuts-ass crazy uh, world of, uh, of crypto technology, the blockchain that's going on right now and nowhere more so than right here in Vancouver. Um, I first of all just want to remind you so we're all level set it about what the technology is all about in a very, very simple way. Uh, explore for a minute why all this fuss is going on and why uh, you can't seem to have an event that has the word blockchain in the title and not sell out in Vancouver these days. Uh, talk about very briefly who the potential winners are coming out of this because this is not an evening to talk about winners. This is an evening to talk about losers and that's where we're going to spend the majority of our time. Uh, because I do want to be consistent, of course, with, uh, with the other speakers you've heard today. Um, I'm going to present two possible outcomes uh, in terms of the impact of this technology. I'm going to let you decide which one you like and which one you want to cheer for. Um, I know I've made my choice. Um, and since we're going to spend half the presentation talk, uh, talking about losers, and I'm always focused on trying to leave you with something practical at the end, um, I want to leave you with one little point at the end about what I think you might be able to do if you haven't done it already, not to end up on that loser list that I'm going to I'm going to drop in front of you as, as we proceed with the, with the talk here. So first of all, um, who has a pretty good idea what blockchain and crypto technology is all about? Pretty good idea. Okay, not that many hands. That's what I would have expected. So blockchain is really a very interesting hybrid set of technologies that consist of two parts. And it's a deceptively simple two parts. The first part is a technology that lets you take a virtual good a virtual good is something you can store on a computer, anything you can store on a computer, like a downloaded brain, you know, little things, and allows you to encode it in such a way that it is protected from counterfeiting, that you can't just make a copy of it, that you know there's only one copy, for example. You can imagine all the other kind of things that you might want to do to protect for counterfeiting. But that's what cryptography is able to do. That technology has been around for 50 years. It was invented by the Brits in the 60s and it's just gotten better and uh, handier and now sits on all our watches, phones, and, com uh, and computers. The second part of blockchain technology is distributed ledger technology. Distributed ledgers mean that we can keep track of exactly who holds each of these virtual goods that have been encoded, and we know when they've been transferred between people and we know that that transfer has occurred, and that that virtual good is very difficult to steal. So in fact, cryptography keeps the holder of the good from committing an offense. The distributed ledger portion keeps everyone else through the act of theft from committing an offense. Now this seems pretty straightforward and you go, ah, what does this matter? How does this relate to anything that affects us in our day-to-day -day lives? Turns out quite a lot because there are some implications of things we can do that we could never do before with information. First of all, there's this curious definition of trust, which is implicit in what this technology can do. And that's not, you know, do I trust Andrew? Is Andrew a nice guy? Is Andrew going to do me right or wrong? Doesn't help us with that kind of trust. That's a human thing. But it does tell me that if Andrew gave me $20, that when I have the $20 in my hand, it's a real 20 and it's mine and he can't take it back. And uh, later, thank you. Um, <laughs> or maybe now. Um, I call that form of trust a deal's a deal, and it helps me remember what that really means. Second 
implication of the technology is this thing called immutability. It's the fact that for the very first time, we can't go back and change history. We can't fiddle with information that's visible to everyone and decide that we want people to see something different. This becomes very expensive and very difficult. I advise a company called CG Blockchain in New York. They do compliance solutions for hedge funds. Guess what hedge fund traders like to do if they want to cheat? They go back and they change the record about what they bought, how much they bought it for, when they bought it, when they sold it, and so on and so forth. This technology makes changing history very, very difficult, which can be very handy. I'm sure you can think of use cases, all of you. The really remarkable one, though, is there's the concept of information persistence. We've always needed a central repository, a single place like a filing cabinet or your hard drive on your computer, your SSD, whatever, where information and the processes around that information have to live. We've needed that centralized repository for almost every transaction we do between us, including banking, financial transactions, medical records, everything. Suddenly, it's possible for this stuff to exist in a massively distributed way with high immutability and have the original source of that information disappear and no longer exist. I call that persistence. And these three things have some interesting implications. And the ones I'm interested in are not the technology ones and not the math ones. It's the, socio, uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, the sociological ones. Those are the ones that interest me the most. Okay? So as always, when there is a new technology or anything new, there are going to be some winners. I was very happy to see that we started with a kind of a boxing theme earlier. We're going to continue the boxing theme today. Um, my business partners live in Yukon. All Yukoners know what happened in the Klondike. What happened in the Klondike is that a small number of people in the Yukon who were in the business of selling picks and shovels convinced half the world to drop what they were doing, uh, take a very expensive trip into a very cold place where they found that there was no gold because all the gold had already been uh, had already been mined out and in fact they made a lot of money selling picks and shovels this has gone on with the internet it's gone on with all kinds of technologies like say automobiles and it's happening in this particular situation as well if you're in the the blockchain picks and shovels i.e platforms and protocols business you might do very well if you're lucky, if you're competent, if you uh, are in the right place at the right time. Second of all, on top of those protocols or those picks and shovels, there will be some interesting applications. Who's heard of CryptoKitties? It's very popular right now. It's shocking. It's more hands than there were last time. CryptoKitties is not one of these fantastic applications, <laughs> even though the people that did it are good friends of some of us in the room. Um, well-conceived, well-designed, and well-monetized decentralized applications uh, are a fantastic way to be a winner in this space. And all those words are very, very important, and I'll try to cover some of those. It is possible to build stuff that has no business using any kind of technology, including this stuff. If you want to be successful, you want to make sure you're doing the right things. And, and I'm going to be, use the very, very carefully selected word long, the long-term investor in crypto businesses and cryptocurrencies that survive. The ones that get through the disaster that is inevitably going to happen, probably quite soon, might do very well as well. And again, I promised you I wasn't gonna hang around with winners for too long, we'll move into the losers, which is of course where all the fun is. So why are there always losers when a new technology comes along? Why does this happen over and over and over again? Well, because of change. We as humans don't do very good with or do very well with change, and we specifically don't do well with black swan type discontinuous change. Everything continues on just fine, whether it's with the environment or with healthcare or with the way society works around gender discrimination, and suddenly something changes. We handle that very, very poorly. Some of us handle it worse than others, and we become the inevitable losers as a result of this. I think Iron Mike has just found out that uh, things are changing in his career right at this moment. So here comes a series of slides where I'm going to talk about one set of potential losers after another. And I hope you guys don't see yourselves on any of these screens so we can just all laugh together at these people that are going to probably lose a lot of money. 
First of all, crypto exchange customers. Who's got an account on a, on a cryptocurrency exchange like Coinbase and so on and so forth? There's a few of those, okay? You should be aware of a few things. First of all, welcome back to the 1920s. The little tricks and games that were played in the 1920s are very actively being played at your expense right now. This is going on like crazy because there's very little of this wonderful regulation stuff that we like to complain about that is protecting you in this particular state. Right here, you see a picture of the New York Stock Exchange in the 1920s. Three kind of games were being played. They are front running, wash trading, and spoofing and layering. Anyone heard any of those? Anyone's a trader here has heard of these things? Let me tell you very, very briefly what those are. Front running is you put a transaction in to buy something with some currency, and someone at the exchange or close to the exchange really likes the deal that you're about to get and inserts their transaction ahead of yours. Theirs clears, yours may not. Fantastic idea. Isn't that great? Wish I thought of that. Wash trading. Wash trading is where you trade with yourself. You put a buy order up, you put a sell order up, you decide what the prices should be and what the spread is between the two. And if it's big enough, you send a signal to the market that says prices should either be going up or going down. You can imagine if you're long or short, which of those you might choose. That's going on like crazy right now. There's not a day and not a Bitcoin exchange where there aren't wash trades sitting out there. Spoofing and layering, last trick. That's where you put up a trade that you don't intend to ever be executed. Just say, I want to buy 10 million Bitcoin at a ridiculously low price. Well, what do you think that's going to do to the market when everyone sees that sitting there? If you're a cryptocurrency customer and you're not aware of these things, you could be on this loser list. If you're about to become a cryptocurrency customer and sign up for an exchange, be careful which one you sign up for. These things are more prevalent on some than others. Anyone recognize uh, this piece of hardware that's sitting over here on the left-hand side? Anyone recognize that? It's one of the most ridiculous misuses of technology ever. Thank goodness it didn't take off. But between 1958 and 1963, NASA and the United States Air Force and a bunch of others decided that they were going to try and build a steel spaceship that will be propelled off the surface of the planet and into space by setting off a series of thousands of atomic bombs behind it. That's what this little thing here, this very complex piece of technology at the bottom is a bunch of springs and a shield. I mean, talk about brainless. Did no one think about what it would mean to build thousands of small atomic bombs in a factory somewhere that maybe some of these they might lose track of? That doesn't happen, does it? Well, here's the thing. There is dishonesty out there amongst companies, and that dishonesty takes a number of different forms. But that dishonesty always results in blockchain being applied for things it shouldn't be applied to. It's just another technology. We've had a bunch of them. It's a hammer, and suddenly everything looks like a nail. I call it bolt-on blockchain. I have a, a pet food distribution business, but I think I'll make it blockchain capable, and I'll issue a token with an ICO. Sounds like a bad idea to me, and there's a lot of bad ideas out there. I call it token without a cause. Why does this go on with companies? Well, the first is blockchain vanity. This is a hot area. A lot of people are fascinated with the technology, and they want to apply it to the thing they're doing anyways. Sometimes that's not smart, but believe me, it goes on. And then there's this self-deception and scamming thing. The question I ask myself is when I see something like this, I say, are you just lying to me or are you lying to yourself as well? Because there's definitely lying going on. And I think because I believe in human nature, maybe wrongly, tonight especially, that a lot of this is self-deception and people are lying to themselves, not just to us. Interestingly, one of the areas, the biggest areas of self-deception is the monetization plans for some of these businesses. If you build something that's truly decentralized, how do you charge for it? How do you charge using a fee on a transaction when the transaction doesn't go through anything that you've built. It doesn't go through your server. It doesn't do anything. This is a huge, huge problem. And then you end up as well with this token value problem right now. You've seen a lot of cryptocurrencies go up crazily in price. 
when you finally build this thing you promised your investors and, and, and token purchasers that you're, you're going to build, when you've built it and suddenly it costs $1,000 a second to use this service, does that do, uh, do anyone any good? Probably not. Um, we had a very, very famous person uh, come from the, uh, the world of crypto to Vancouver recently do a quiet little presentation. He believes, I won't tell you who, that 95% of the businesses out there using t this technology are scamming themselves or you or both. If you are a financial intermediary or anything that looks like a financial intermediary, you are on the loser list, quite potentially. This idea of tr changing the definition of trust and this idea of information persistence that enables decentralization means goodbye to bank tellers, notaries, brokers, agents, payment companies, and almost any kind of exchange, especially if it's exchanging one virtual good to another. You don't really need a centralized organization to do that. Why would you pay someone a fee for something that you don't require? When these things can be directly traded back and forth from one computer to another, from your pocket to theirs, from my phone to yours, uh, this is a bad business to be in. I don't recommend you stick around if this is the business you're in. Here's one of my favorites, regulators. We spent some time uh, last week about this time talking to the BC Lotteries Commission or was it the BC um, Securities Commission? I think they're, I get them mixed up, those two. Um, I like to think that you can regulate fire, but it's very hard to regulate smoke and that you can implement almost anything in a blockchain but not a border. Regulators require a jurisdiction. They require a line around what they control. And if suddenly that line isn't meaningful because virtual goods are floating in and out and left and right, how do you regulate that? It means you actually have to make friends with every other regulator in the world and I don't think they're very good at that. You can't enforce, you cannot enforce and therefore you cannot regulate. Now I'm gonna get back to that in a little second when we talk about federal governments, another one that I think is a big loser. The question I'll leave you with is, you know those three tricks I told you about? How do we protect ourselves from those three tricks under these circumstances? I don't have an answer to that and neither does the Lotteries Commission. If you are a federal level government employee, you could be on the loser list because federal governments everywhere make their money by collecting taxes. They collect taxes because they control the bank account that you use to run your financial life. And they can make sure that they can see what you earned, what you spent, and that you paid tax on it all. If transactions no longer flow through that same type of bank account that they can see, what do you do? You suddenly can't collect taxes the same way anymore. We could very well be going, unfortunately, to the world that we've heard described a couple of times, this user pay world where the rich can afford services and the poor cannot. And this is reinforced by this kind of technology, whether we like it or not. <laughs> the ICO token speculator. Who's bought, who's bought an, uh, an ICO issued token in the room? Anyone want to admit it? There's one, two, three, there's a few. Boy, you guys are brave, right on. To talk to them after, find out uh, what's going on. Uh, this, is, this is the one that was offered to me, uh, the Nick coin. You can see it's got all the buzzwords in it. Um, about three billion, three billion dollars have been raised. That's more than the entire venture capital industry since this all started about a year and a half ago in, back in, steeped in, in prehistory. To me, a high percentage of these tokens make absolutely no sense. I don't know why the thing they're building requires a token to start with. I don't get it. I think this is a game of musical chairs. The music is short. There are not many chairs, a lot fewer than there are in the room here. I would be very, very careful if I was going down this road. You are a speculator. Make sure you know you're a speculator. Don't kid yourself. Uh, 14 days for Nick's token, by the way. Be ready. So I promised you a uh, couple of worlds I'm going to describe to you and you can decide which one you like. It's shocking the people in our, in our crypto world which one they choose because they like this one quite a lot. Um, there's a lot of people that are going to lose a lot here. This is a big socio-economic upheaval that can potentially happen. How fast? No one knows but the possibility is there. Three billion dollars might be lost. Um, what does that mean? Very interesting. Um, I think wherever you have a redistribution of power, 
from things like governments, unions, banks, and so on and so forth, you can have resistance to that. How is, res what form is resistance going to take? Is it going to be police action? Is it going to be, you know, any of the things, again, that we've heard described earlier could happen. I think if we're not careful, this kind of technology can result in a larger rich-poor divide rather than a smaller rich-poor divide for some of the reasons that I've described. And we could end up in the situation we're in right now. I call it a, co a cognitocracy. It's a world where the people who know have an advantage. The people who can set up a wallet, who can invest in cryptocurrencies and so on, have, a, have an advantage. The people that don't know and can't or aren't confident lose. Or alternately, there's this utopian version that says, well, with the wider distribution of information and availability of information, we could be more democratic, we could be more egalitarian. We, it would no longer matter whether we're in a small village in Africa or in Whitehorse, Yukon, or in Vancouver, or in downtown New York City. We would have the same financial opportunities, the same access to capital, and so on and so forth. And it's what we do in the transactions we have, the value that we add, that matters. Because transactions that we participate in are the only way we'll ever get any value. It's the only thing we'll ever be paid for. We cannot tax. We cannot steal a little bit from some work that others are doing. And with that, and I think this applies to both of these worlds, comes greater personal responsibility and accountability and authority. The government will not protect grandma from losing the money in her savings account. So, in conclusion, I want to leave you something practical. How do you avoid ending up on the loser list and maybe be the one with the uh, winner belts and so on and so forth? And in case I haven't been preachy enough, uh, I'll give you a heavy opinion warning on this. Um, first of all, uh, this is going to happen. It is happening already. This is going to change a lot about our financial lives, whether we like it or not. It's going to change your financial life, whether you like it or not, and your information life in general. Now's the time to start fooling around with these technologies. Go buy a crypto kitty if that's, your, uh, if that, if that's what uh, gets you excited. It at least gets you started understanding and setting up the technology and so on and learning how it works. You don't want to be an intermediary in the future. If your career depends on you standing in the middle of another transaction where the real value is being exchanged, I think you want to consider changing that, at least changing your attitude towards it. I think you do not want to be one of those losers who's misusing this technology just because it's the current hot thing. Ten years or five years from now, we won't be talking about it. It'll just be part of what we use every day. The trend will be gone, and only the things that really matter will be left. And if you're a speculator, I'm really worried about you. I think if you're not thinking five to ten years in terms of getting a return from some money and, and value that you're putting into this, you're probably not thinking far enough up.